great delight and privilege to introduce our guest speaker today, Father Gregory Boyle. Born in Los Angeles, Greg began his affinity for gangs early on as one of eight children. <laughs> After graduating from Loyola High School in LA in 1972, he entered the Society of Jesus, most commonly known as the Jesuits, and was ordained in 1984. Father Greg earned his BA in English from Gonzaga University, an MA in English from Loyola Marymount University, a Master of Divinity degree from Weston Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge, which has now morphed over to the School of Theology and Ministry with the Institute for Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry. So Greg is um, an alum and a Sacred Theology Master's from the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley. Father Greg's first ministries included teaching at Loyola High School and working with Christian-based communities in Cochabamba, Bolivia. In 1986, he was appointed the pastor of the Dolores Mission in the LA Boyle Heights, which, by the way, is named after Greg. Isn't it? You told me it was, Greg. Where he served for six years. In 1988, Father Greg created Jobs for a Future through Dolores Mission, a program intended to address the escalating problems and unmet needs of gang involved youth. He and his co workers made credible their motto Nothing stops a bullet like a job. By establishing an elementary school for kids who could not make it in any other school a daycare program, and by finding legitimate employment for young people. In 1992, as a response to the civil unrest in LA, Father Greg separated from Dolores Mission and launched the first business, Homeboy Bakery, to provide training, work experience, and above all, the opportunity for rival gang members to work side by side. Given its success in 2001, Father Greg was able to establish additional businesses and become an independent nonprofit organization, now Homeboy Industries. Today, Homeboy Industries includes Homeboy Bakery, Homeboy Silkscreen, Homeboy Maintenance, Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise, and Homegirl Cafe. Father Greg, an acknowledged expert on gangs and intervention approaches, is a nationally known speaker. And if you question that, go to his website. Um, my young, youngest sister went to your website yesterday, Greg, and she said, I can't believe how, how that man speaks. He's all over the place. In 1998, he was a member of a 10-person California delegation to President Clinton's Summit on Children. And in 2005, he and several homies were featured speakers at the White House Conference on Youth. He has served as a consultant to numerous groups and now serves on the National Gang, excuse me, National Gang Center Advisory Board within the U.S. Department of Justice. Greg's awards, too num numerous to list in full, include the California Peace Prize by the California Wellness Foundation, a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Mexamer Legal Defense and Education Fund, the Civic Medal of Honor by the LA Chamber of Commerce. LA Headquarters Association honored him as one of the city's leading visionaries responsible for changing the face of LA. And the Citizen of the Year by LA Chapter of Public Relations Society of America. He's received numerous honorary degrees including from Claremont University and Occidental College. For me, it's no surprise that Father Greg is an English major and master. His book, Tattoos on the Heart, is laced with beautiful poetic imagery that gives us a window into what makes Father Greg Boyle, Father Greg G, tick. Within that book, we hear phrases like, and we are put on earth a little space that we may learn to bear the beams of love. Ruskin's comment that you can get someone to remove his coat more surely with warm, gentle sun than with a cold, blistering wind. Merton's comment that we discover our true selves in love. And Greg's paraphrase, 
no, love never fails. It will always find a way to have its way. The conviction that love is the surest, indeed the only way, it seems you live this, Greg. Thank you, and welcome. Thank you for, for that kind introduction. I'm realizing how many people I quoted and it, not very much original thought in, uh, from Thomas Merton to Ruskin. Um, so the Catholic Christian definition of justice, no, forget it. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna let you guys come up with that. You know, here's the deal. Uh, so many of you have come up to me and said, I heard you last night, so I thought, you know, um, I'm not going to say anything that I said last night. Uh, if you want to hear what I said last night, uh, come to, uh, where am I going? St. Cecilia's? Yeah, so um, that's tonight. Uh, so I'm not going to tell any stories that I told last night. I may have uh, content things, you know, but not stories. Uh, you know, I've been on the road a lot. I feel like I've sort of been visiting the swing states or something, you know. <laughs> I, um, so I'm anxious to get home. I, I've been on the road really for two weeks, but uh, except for one day I, I did drop home and then I, I was on, on a plane again. So I love going home, you know, it's, uh, I really look forward to it. I'm kind of chomping at the bit a little bit. Um, it's, you know, while I've been gone, you know, I've been getting text messages of photographs of uh, homies who've had uh, babies, you know, and it's been very sweet. You know, I remember I, I got home once after uh, you know about four or five days away, and uh, one of the homies, Gus, who was the receptionist at the time, said he pointed at this homie named Lupin. And he said he's been waiting for you for three days to get home, and so he gave me a big abrazo, and and he said while you were gone, my son was born. I said, wow, nice going. Tell me what when was he born? On his birthday. <laughs> I said, wow. I mean, what are the chances of that happening? You know. Uh, you know, and, and so it, it, uh, God love uh, phones and texts, and, and I've just been frantically texting people and getting my voicemail fills up while I'm on the road. And, and uh, I remember a homie named Moreno who I was always trying to get him to change his language, you know, because he's just kind of mal hablado, and, and, you know, he'll be walking by and say something, language, I always say that to him, and, oh, I'm Spansa, sorry. And um, so he left me a, a voicemail, and he was always trying as best he could, and he left me a voicemail message. Hey, gee, this is Moreno and shit. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Moreno and feces, he said to me. You know, which, uh, I, I think we can all agree, progress. Uh, the poet Mary Oliver writes, there's some things you can't reach, but you can reach out to them and all day long. Uh, I'm not going to be kind of in the weeds kind of person, uh, at least not in this first 45 minutes. I, you know, I'm kind of aerial view. What, what are we reaching out for? Uh, you know, obviously I think part of what we want to do is uh, create a community of kinship such that God in fact might recognize it. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no peace. No matter how singularly focused we may well be, on justice and peace can't happen unless we have this place of kinship where we are in this together. There is no us and them. Uh, there's just us. Uh, Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly, I think, when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against that? How do we imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle. And to that end, we're all called in our way, but especially in our prison ministry, to inch our way out to the margins so we can stand in the right place, to stand exactly where Jesus stood, to take seriously what Jesus took seriously, uh, standing with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless, standing with those whose dignity has been denied and those whose burdens are more than they can bear. Everyone in this room has had that exquisite, privileged experience of being able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out, with the demonized, so that the demonizing will stop, and with the disposable, 
so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. This is not my call, and this isn't even your call. This is our call as members of the human race. And if kinship, in fact, was our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice, we would, in fact, be celebrating it. I think that part of our, that what is the task before us? I think the task really is to dismantle. It sounds negative, but I, I think it's, it sort of focuses us a little bit. We are called to dismantle the barriers that exclude, and we are called to dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that keep folks from seeing the truth of who they are. We're dismantlers. That's what our mission is about, really. And because where you choose to stand is a proclamation. It pronounces something. It says, what if we were to invest in people rather than just seek to endlessly incarcerate our way out of this problem. Uh, the, the novel uh, Passage to India by E.M. Forster begins with these words, only connect. It's all relational. That was a question that came up earlier. How do we connect? We need to break this wide open. Uh, we need to see that this is a human thing, not a rarefied, specialized thing. This is about human beings connecting to each other, and that's really, really the hope. Um, I, I'm on, on the road a lot, and I take homies when I can, and I took uh, two homies with me, uh, principally to go to D.C. to um, uh, speak to a congressional subcommittee hearing on gang violence. And, uh, and so we also had uh, a stop before we got to D.C. to New York, where uh, we had several talks at a, a parish and at a high school. Uh, the two homies I brought with me were uh, Lewis and Joseph, and older guys, uh, you know, late uh, 20s, and, uh, you know, been through prison and tattooed and gang members, and, and two of the largest fellows who ever worked at Homeboy, they're just, just big, large and in charge guys, you know, and, and uh, uh, Joseph had never been on a, on a plane, and uh, so we were flying to New York, and Lewis uh, was uh, uh, Dominican and grew up in New York for at least for 10 years until a very abusive family situation and came to L.A. and got into a gang and a lot of issues. And so we're flying, and so, so we're sitting there, and Joseph's at the window, and then Lewis and me. And Lewis turns to Joseph and says, so what do you want to see when we go to New York? Because Lewis knew a little bit about New York, even though it was a long time ago. And Joseph was really clear. I want to see the Empire State Building. I want to see the Statue of Liberty. And I want to see, of course, the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> and Lewis said, fool, that's in Paris, you know. And, and Joseph turned to him, if looks could kill. And he said, well, then I guess I'll take it off my list then. <laughs> so we get to DC. We do this congressional thing. And then we had some time, you know, like a day. Uh, or part of a day where we, you know, Washington Monument and, and uh, Smithsonian, that kind of thing. And I said, we got to go to the Holocaust Museum. If you've ever been there, it's just so powerful. Uh, it's not really a museum. It's a kind of a, a full e experience. And I've been there many times. I've brought homies there. So we, at one, I said, look, uh, we've got two hours, uh, uh, three hours, I guess, one to four. And I said, you go ahead and walk around on your own, and we'll meet back here at four. Um, in the lobby, and uh, so we did at four, and then and the, these guys were kind of shaken by the experience, and it's so powerful. If you've never been, you need to go. And so we're uh, kind of debriefing about the thing, and Joseph says, "Wow, gosh, people really suffered. This is I, this was kind of I didn't know anything about this really." And uh, right to the right of us was a desk, and there was a man in his 80s sitting behind the desk. He's reading a book. There's a chair in front of the desk that seems to be inviting you to take a seat. And there's a sign on the desk, and it says, Holocaust Survivor. And we look at that, and, and uh, Joseph says, gosh, what would we say to somebody who suffered so much? And Lewis is fearless, so he says, well, I'm going to go sit down and talk to him. You know, and we said, well, we'll be in the gift store. So, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so he sits down, and he tells, about, tells us about it later. And uh, the man's name is Jacob, and uh, he's uh, in his 80s, and he was in Auschwitz. And he was there as a 13-year-old boy. 
and both parents were uh, killed there. His uh, uh, two sisters were executed right before his eyes. A niece and a nephew also murdered. Um, he was a worker, so they spared him. And he uh, was there for several years until the camp was liberated. And Lewis is listening to his story with great attention. When he finishes, Lewis pulls out his card and he says, I work at Homeboy Industries. It's the largest gang intervention, rehab, and reentry program in, in the United States. I, I hope if you're ever in LA, you'll visit. And Jacob studies the thing. And then Lewis says, I'm 27 years old. I have spent half my life locked up. Well, for some reason, um, Jacob sort of dismisses this a little bit. And he goes, American prisons. Uh, you've got your own room. You've got your own bed. You've got a pillow. We slept on wood planks. If you said one word in line, the guards would pull you out and beat you severely. Lewis listens to him, and he says, yeah, I, I was beaten so many times in county jail. In fact, once I was pulled out of line. I was beaten so badly, my head, I looked like I was the elephant man. They threw me into a cell naked, and I slept on a metal sheet. And Jacob listens. It, it's at this point I kind of interject something. I go, okay, Lewis, let me see if I've got this right. You were comparing your experience uh, with a Holocaust survivor? And he was very clear and very sure, and he said, no, I wasn't comparing my experience. There is no comparison between what I've suffered and what he's gone through. Then his eyes fill up with tears, and he can barely speak this. He says, no, I wasn't competing with him. I was connecting with him. Only connect, that's the goal. There's an idea that's taken root in the world, it's at the root of all that's wrong with it, and the idea would be this, that there just might be lives out there that matter less than other lives. How do we stand against that idea? How do we seek together a compassion that can stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it? How then do we imagine lives that aren't our own? So Homeboy Industries was born during the time I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. Together at the time, they comprised the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. We had eight gangs at war with each other during that period, which is not very typical making it, according to the LAPD, the place of the highest concentration of gang activity uh, in the whole city. I buried my first young person killed because of the sadness in 1988. I buried my 185th uh, two weeks ago, a young man named Angel. We did a lot of things. We started a middle school because there were so many junior high age uh, gang members who had been given the boot from their home school. Nobody wanted them. So I... Uh, went out to the projects and asked them, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, they all said, yeah. Then I couldn't find a school that would take them. So I asked the nuns to kindly vacate the convent, and they were really so nice about that. And, <laughs> yeah. and so we turned the convent, which was on the third floor of the elementary school, into a school for gang members, basically. And they came in large numbers, which should tell us something, that they had this longing for something. Uh, that created something of a disconnect with the, the people in the parish, you know, aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed, good people in and bad people out? And so that was a good challenge, but it was tough in the early days. And then uh, they said, if only we had jobs, and so um, myself and the women, we marched all around the factories that surrounded the parish, trying to find felony-friendly employers, and that wasn't so forthcoming. So in 1992, after the unrest in the city, we started a business, Homeboy Bakery. Uh, got a movie producer to buy this old 80-year-old dilapidated bakery across the street. If it had been an upholstery shop, we would have started with Homeboy Upholstery or something. So we started Homeboy Bakery, enemies working side by side baking bread. 
A month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market. Once we had plural, we came up with uh, the highfalutin Homeboy Industries. Uh, not everything worked. Homeboy Plumbing was really not a huge success. <laughs> Apparently, people didn't want gang members in their homes, so I uh, didn't know that. So, and then, um, <laughs> And now uh, we have backed our way into becoming uh, this really large place. And so uh, you name it, uh, we do it. We have uh, all sorts of curricular things, anything that might be helpful, uh, a mental health counseling, tattoo removal, huge clinic, three machines and 10,000 treatments a year, and all our businesses. Um, so most of you were there last night, so, and the introduction already delineated that. Uh, it, we try to respond and listen, you know, since somebody mentioned housing, you know, what good is a job if, if you don't have a place to lay your head, you know. The thing about gang members is they're largely homeless. It's, nobody really sees that. Um, if they come out of prison, no one will rent to them. And especially in Los Angeles, as it would be true here, I think, you know, uh, unless you have the first months, last months, and the deposit, how do you get in? So we help homies do that. Uh, as long as they, they're, you know, they can pick a rent that they can actually maintain, we help them with that first piece. Uh, before the economy went south, you know, we were going to uh, kind of build uh, this place that would provide you know, housing for folks right out of prison, but uh, we weren't able to do that. Maybe someday. So that's sort of what Homeboy uh, is. You know, uh, all of us are called to be what Alice Miller, the child, the great child psychologist, calls enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused attempt of love return people to themselves. Um, you don't hold the bar up and ask anybody to measure up, you just show up and uh, you hold the mirror up and you tell people the truth, knowing that uh, their truth is my truth and my truth is a gang member's truth and it all happens to be the same truth, and the truth is this. You are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. And then you watch as folks on the margins become that truth. You watch as they inhabit that truth. And no bullet can pierce it, no four prison walls can keep it out, and death can't touch it because it's huge. But part of your task in prison ministry, of course, is to dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way that keep folks from seeing that truth. Uh, Marcus Borg, the great scripture scholar, says that the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and throughout scripture is shame and disgrace. And I think that's quite right. So I had a homie who worked for me named Filiberto, Fili we called him, and probably the saddest homie I've ever met. You know, he was just always had this low grade kind of sadness uh, it was hard to kind of get him to a place of joy. Uh, I think part of it was he beat himself up. You know, talk about shame and disgrace. He, large family, the only gang member in it. And I remember once my brother and his wife came to visit one of our, uh, I think it was our third headquarters. Now we're in our fourth one. And after the tour, they left and Feely very sadly said, uh, what's your brother do for a living? I said, well, he's a principal in a middle school down in uh, San Diego. And your cuñada, your sister-in-law. I said, well, she's a um, nurse in an intensive care unit at a hospital in San Diego. He shook his head with great sadness, and he said, damn, G, everyone in your family is somebody, which I guess meant that he thought he was nobody and equally all the members of his family. So one day he comes into my office, and out of the wild blue yonder, he says, hey, I, I found this flica of myself the other day, I guess I'm about 10 years old, Fleek as a photograph. Yeah, I look at it, I go, damn, that's me? I go, well, that's interesting, you know, it seemed like an odd thing to say. Two days later, he, he kind of brought the subject up again, kind of uh, out of the blue. He said, yeah, you know, I keep staring at that Fleek. It's a little black and white. I think my parents took it for purposes of the migra, you know, for immigration purposes. I can't believe it's me, I keep staring at it. I go, yeah, Phil, you know, you mentioned that the other day, and I think this is so odd. And finally, about three days later, he comes into my office and he tosses this flica on my desk, and there is little 10-year-old Feely with uh, uh, 
you know, with a very sad look on his face, still. But he had this huge shock of hair, and he was currently sh had his head shaved, which is what gang members do. And I didn't know what to say, and I said, damn, Feely, you got hair. I don't know what to say to him, you know. And, <laughs> and then I don't know whether, is he giving me this, or does he uh, want it back? So the only way to do that is to extend it back to him, and, and he doesn't take it. And he says, do you think there's any way we can make it big? And I go, well, gosh, sure. So at the end of the day, I, I went to the mall and I walked into the camera store and the guy says, can I help you, sir? And I go, make it big. <laughs> and apparently it was too small to make big. And I said, no, you know, you, you really have to enlarge this photograph. It has to be larger than it currently is. So the guy worked his magic and suddenly it, it, it became a kind of four by four or something and a little bit green, a little bit grainy. This is not a story about a photograph. It's a story about the self made to feel too small from having been bombarded with messages of shame and disgrace. And this is one of the dismantling tasks in prison ministry is to reach in. You gotta reach in and you have to dismantle and shake that up. And you have to discover the kinship that we share as people who are exactly what God had in mind. You know, I'm in 25 different detention facilities where I celebrate the Eucharist and uh, in probation camps and juvenile halls and jails. And then I, I race home to Dolores Mission uh, because I've been there for 27 years and I know everybody and people ask me to do stuff, you know. So my Saturdays always kind of look the same. You know, one o'clock baptism, two o'clock quinceanera where a girl turns uh, 15, three o'clock wedding, four o'clock exorcism. Uh, <laughs> just, just checking to see if you're still listening to me. <laughs> I've actually never done one of those, but I... So this one day I raced home and, it, and I got home in time with traffic and everything at 12.30. I go, great, I have a half hour before my one o'clock baptism. So I, you know, I go to my office, ooh, contento, feliz, I'm opening my mail all by myself. When all of a sudden this woman barges through the front door, her name I find out is Lisa. She's in her early 30s, she's a gang member, tattooed, heroin addict, kind of an uh, infamous prostitute on First Street. Uh, she's something of a famous gritona. She's always screaming. You can hear her scream at the guy who tosses her out of the bar next door. You can hear her holler into a payphone on First Street, just let me stay tonight, pleading with family or friends. This very first time she's ever stepped foot in my office. And now I notice it's seven minutes to one in my baptism. She barrels right in, plunks herself down, launches in. I need help. Ooh, I've been to like 50 rehabs. I'm known all over, nationwide. <laughs> Went to Catholic schools all my life, she says. Graduated from elementary. I even graduated from Sacred Heart High School in Lincoln Heights. And then she gets quiet and still. And she says, in fact, first time I ever used heroin was right after I graduated. And I've been trying to stop since the moment I began. And I watched as she leaned her head on the wall behind her and her eyes became like two ponds, water rising to meet its edges and spilling over. And she cried and she cried. Until finally, she leveled her gaze at me and she said, I am a disgrace. And suddenly her shame meets mine. Because when I had seen her step into my office that day, I had mistaken her for an interruption. It's mutual. We enter into the mutuality to which Jesus invites us the same mutuality in which he lived. If we take seriously what Jesus took seriously, we enter into this place of kinship, not the distance of service provider, service recipient, not even the distance of men and women for others, 
but the same mutuality of Jesus that says we are one with each other. And so we seek to dismantle the barriers that exclude. Uh, my favorite um, miracle in all of the gospel is when uh, Jesus is in this packed house and uh, you know, it's, nobody else can get in. It's in direct violation of the fire code. And there, <laughs> some are fearful that the fire inspector will actually arrive, you know, and shut the thing down. And then you have the two industrious guys outside with the paralytic on the mat. And go figure, they get up on the roof and they rip a hole on the roof and they lower the guy into the middle of the... Uh, room and you can just imagine Jesus looking at this thing and yes the cabrones I can't believe they just did this and um, and of course everybody's looking at the fact that Jesus heals this guy and suddenly he's up and running but it's something of a miracle that these two folks outside ripped the roof off the place and suddenly somebody who was outside is inside our task in prison ministry really are to be dismantlers. We dismantle the barriers that exclude so that the circle widens and more people are inside. And we dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that keep people from seeing the truth. Folks are returned to themselves and you are returned to yourself by participating in this exquisite mutuality of kinship and the soul felt its worth, as it says in O Holy Night. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till you appeared, and the soul felt its worth. People returned to themselves. It's a story of Jesus, and it's a story of Christmas. But how is it not the job description of everybody in prison ministry? You appear, the soul feels its worth. Over the years, uh, you know, I, I continue occasionally to struggle with my own health and leukemia and, and chemo and doing okay at the moment. Uh, but when I first had leukemia, you know, suddenly I, I was getting these lifetime achievement awards, if you know what I mean, you know. And, uh, so, uh, so one of them was an LMU and I couldn't go to it and, uh, because I was speaking at Santa Clara. So I said, you know, would you mind so much if I uh, sent a homie named Pascual Peña, who works at the Silk Screen, if he could accept this award on my behalf. And, and I never keep these awards. I always give them to the homies because they're my heroes. And so uh, they said, sure. And so I, I called this kid in. He's 19 years old, father of a, a small son. And I said, Pascual, do me a paro. Accept this award for me at LMU. And he goes, oh my God, I'd be honored. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot. You got to give a little acceptance speech. No, you know, <laughs> too late. You already said yes. So, so I said, write something down, and I'll have Kara, who uh, lives in Boston, work for me for ten years, and uh, saw her last night. And she's, uh, I said, she'll take you to LMU. Don't worry about it. Well, I hear all about it when I get home. And and uh, poor Bas Pasquale is in this car, and he just wants to leap out at every stop sign. And. <laughs> And I can't do this. I'm too scared to speak in front of people. And Kara says, look, you know, um, here's a tip. Everybody knows this tip, you know. They say if you're nervous speaking in front of a large crowd, just imagine your entire audience is naked, you know. <laughs> Relax. I'm not using this tactic at the moment. <laughs> this table here is starting to get a little, a little squirmy, you know, if you know what I mean. And he said, it, and she said, just imagine your audience is naked. And I said, I can't do that. I'd be staring the whole time. <laughs> so it goes from bad to worse. They get to the St. Robert's Hall, and the place is packed and standing room only. And, um, and so they say, and, uh, you know, accepting the word for Father Greg Boyle, Pascual Peña. So Pascual gets up there, and he has his little line paper, and he's all temblando, and, and uh, he's reading this thing. And he handed it to me when I, when I got back. And uh, I just remember the last line. He says, because Father Greg and Homeboy Industries uh, believed in me, I've decided to believe in myself. And the best way I can think of paying them back is by changing my life. And that's exactly what I've done. Thank you very much. And he sits down while well, the crowd goes nuts. You know, standing ovation, uh, whatever the verb is, they were ovulating. You know, it was like... Uh, <laughs> whatever for ovation and uh, 
clapping, crying. He comes back to his seat and he, you know, everybody's standing still and the man next to him is clapping but he's crying. It's mocos donde quiera and people are handing out Kleenex and Kara's clapping and crying and finally he turns to her and says, damn, they're sure clapping a lot for Father Greg. <laughs> and she goes, Menso, they're not clapping for G, they're clapping for you. And it was like, you know, she had electrocuted him. No, he says, you know. She goes, yeah, they're clapping for you. And it was like this room of virtual total strangers had chosen to hold the mirror up and return this kid to himself. And suddenly kinship so quickly. And who doesn't know by now that that's the only praise that God has any interest in, truly. A homie uh, who uh, uh, kind of avoided all my efforts at helping him was a kid named Bandit who was, uh, um, you know, one of the biggest drug dealers in town. And I used to ride my bike in the middle of the night into uh, Aliso Village and I'd see him there run up to cars and selling crack cocaine. And then he'd walk back to me counting his money and then he'd see me and then he'd get suddenly embarrassed and spend some, sorry. And, and, but no matter how many times I handed him my card, he'd just resisted my efforts to help him. Ours is a God who waits, and who are we not to? It takes what it takes, as they say in recovery. So one day, um, Bandit shows up in my office, and yes, Milagro, I can't believe you're here. And he says what homies often say, I'm tired of being tired. So I walk him to one of our four job developers, and as luck would have it, they locate an entry-level, unskilled, low-paying kind of job warehouse, first kind of job. Now cut to today, Bandit runs the place. He's el mero chingon of the whole place. He's the supervisor of all the supervisors. He, uh, he runs the whole shooting match. Married, owns his own home, has three kids. So one Friday he calls me kind of panicky and I hadn't heard from him in a long time and no news is good news with gang members and he says, gee, you gotta bless my daughter. And I said, ¿Qué pasó, Michael? Is she sick? Is she in the hospital? Oh, no, no, he says. Uh, on Monday, she's going to Humboldt College. Imagine my oldest, my Jessica. She's going to college. But she's a little chaparita, and, and I'm a, scared for her, you know, because that's far, that's way up north, and she's leaving home. Do you think you could give her a blessing before she goes? And I said, gosh, are you kidding me? I'd be honored to. Look, tomorrow's Saturday, I have an exorcism at 1. Uh, <laughs> why don't you come at 12.30 and, and we'll, do, we'll do a little send-off. And sure enough, uh, uh, Bandit and his wife and, and the three kids, including tiny little Jessica, show up. And so I said, well, let's uh, you know, form a little circle here. And I will, uh, uh, you know, let's everybody connect, only connect, touch her, put your hands on her shoulders, on her head. And, Bow your heads and close your eyes, and as the homies say, I do a long-ass prayer. You know, I go on and on, and, and somewhere in the middle of this thing, I notice we've all become chiones. We're all crying, and I don't know why we're crying exactly, except for the fact that Bandit and his wife don't know anybody who's ever gone to college except me, certainly nobody in their families. Uh, so, you know, we kind of wipe our eyes and we laugh about how mushy we got and, and so I, I turned to Jessica to sort of change the subject and, and uh, I said, hey, what are you going to study at Humboldt? And she was very quick, forensic psychology. I go, damn, forensic psychology. <laughs> and Bandit chimes in, yeah, she wants to study the criminal mind. <laughs> and Jessica, very deadpan, turns to her father and does one of these, you know. And, <laughs> And he sees her and he laughs and he says, yep, I'm going to be her first subject. <laughs> so we go out to the car and big abrazos and they pile in the car. But Bandit hangs back and I'm glad he has. And I said, hey, can I tell you something? I give you credit for the man you've chosen to become, for choosing to walk in your own footsteps. I'm proud of you. And his eyes fill up with tears and he says, sabes que, I'm proud of myself. All my life, people called me a low life, a bueno para nada, a good for nothing. I guess I showed them. I said, yeah, I guess you did. And the soul feels its worth. Exactly right. 
last story uh, was mentioned kindly in the introduction that uh, in a previous regime that some of you may recall, um, my, uh, myself and the homies uh, went to a conference uh, sponsored by the White House. Uh, but it was preceded by a visit by Laura Bush to uh, Homeboy Industries. She was traveling around the country. We were the only gang intervention program she visited. So uh, we're the, it was going to take place at our silk screen, which is our biggest business, a big factory. And, and the, the Clint Eastwood type, who was in charge of the Secret Service detail, uh, came to me and said, Father, I, uh, you know, only 25 people can be at this thing, and, and said, uh, so I'm going to need the list of names of the 25 who will shake hands with the First Lady. I need their names. I need their birth dates. I need their social security numbers. So we decided to declare undocumented worker day off day on that day. Uh, <laughs> so I typed up the list and I handed it to uh, Clint. And, um, and he came back two days later and he said, wow, Father, gosh. Um, you know, these people have records, he says to me. Uh, like this news might come as a surprise to me. And, and I say, well, at Homeboy Industries, kind of the idea, you know. So anyway, so the visit came and went off without a hitch. And, and it was uh, the homies and homegirls felt so good about themselves. Well, three months later, I get a phone call from a staffer at the uh, First Lady's office at the White House. And she said, you know, um, Mrs. Bush is sponsoring a conference at Howard University in Washington, D.C. called Helping America's Youth. And uh, the First Lady would like you to be a keynote speaker at it. I said, wow, be honored. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot. She would like you to bring three homies with you. <laughs> now, whether Mrs. Bush actually used the H word, <laughs> can't, can't be certain. And, and then she said afterwards, a select group of participants, not everybody, but a select group, uh, will be invited into the White House for dinner. Now, certainly crooks have resided in this house before, <laughs> but uh, may well be the first time gang members have ever stepped foot in there. So, you know, I went uh, in search of three of the most menacing looking gang members I could find, just to mess with the White House a little bit. And so, so I get uh, Gabriel um, and Gus and Herbie. And uh, the three of them been to prison, tattooed, and did a variety of things for me. And I call them in. I said, look, you're going to the White House for dinner. You cannot wear size 85 waist dickies. So <laughs> we're going to get you some suits. And so, of course, we go to the men's warehouse. You know, you're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it. You know, and well, that guy wasn't there. But we, uh, we walk into the men's warehouse in Burbank, and I I swear to you, every single solitary salesperson rushes us at the door as if to say, how may we uh, help the three of you leave our store as quickly as possible? <laughs> and I say, well, you know, we're going to be needing suits. They're going to dinner at the White House, you know, and uh, yeah, right. So, uh, so they dispatch them into dressing rooms, and I, uh, I'm picking out ties. And, and all of a sudden, one of our first of our group, Gabriel, comes out wearing a perfectly fitted light gray suit. And he's staring at himself in the mirror, and he can't believe his eyes, and he's just mouth wide open. Now, Gabriel was covered in tattoos, his whole neck and face, and had undergone uh, some treatments at that point. Uh, Gabriel did a lot of things for us at Homeboy at the time, but he was our premier tour guide. He would be waiting for you at the door. A lot of tour groups come through Homeboy. And he'd uh, take you and walk you around, introduce you to the job developers, hand you goggles so you could watch tattoos being removed on the premises, Hand you a hairnet so you could watch enemy rival gang members bake bread together. He gave exceptional to tours. But far beyond that was really the quality and size and character of his heart. The day won't ever come when I am more noble or have more courage or I am closer to God than Gabriel. Though the packaging, I guess, might suggest otherwise. So I walk up to him and I, I tap him on the shoulder and he still stares at the guy in the mirror in the suit. I say, are you okay? And he doesn't take his eyes off himself and he says, damn, gee, I'm already pinching myself. Well, I bought the tickets well in advance and uh, so I, you know, but I, I call him in for some reason two weeks before we're scheduled to leave and, and I, I say, um, he sits down. I said, did you ask permission of your parole officer to go to this trip, by the way? Oh, of course I did. I said, good. You know, I'm just checking. Yeah, she said no. I said, Gabriel, <laughs> we're, we're about to leave. You know, um, 
Well, I was afraid you wouldn't let me go if I told you that. I said, Mijo, we got to do this the right way. So give me your number. And with him there, I call this woman and, and I give the whole spiel, you know, White House dinner suits. And, and she listens to me and then she says, nope, high control. And some of you might know high control parole means you're not going anywhere. So I said, could I talk to your supervisor? And so she moves me to the supervisor and I give the spiel one more time. And the guy says, no way, high control parolee. I said, wow, um, is there somebody like a notch above you, you know? And so they transfer me to the notch guy and I, <laughs> I give the spiel and the guy says, let me be really clear with you, Father. He's a high control parolee. He's not going anywhere. And they all seem to be having a very bad case of, uh, and Gabriel, who exactly did you think you were? That you get to go to the White House for dinner? Well, faxes and emails and letters and everything from the Department of Justice and the White House and uh, the First Lady's office and what may well be the singular accomplishment of the Bush administration. <laughs> <clears throat> we got permission to go, you know. Uh, we were going to go anyway, but I, I find that permission beats it. So on the day of our departure, it was mishap after mishap. The homies were late and, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, get halfway to the airport and I say, did all of you bring your IDs, you know, and calladitos, silence, and then a lone voice in the back seat, shit. <laughs> well, it's Gus. He forgot his ID. We had to go back. So um, anyway, we get to, uh, to D.C. and we do the touristy things. And then Thursday comes, which is the day of the conference, the day of the White House, the day of the suits. And that's when we discover that poor old Gabriel that as he was running to my car in that early morning darkness on Tuesday when we were departing, that he was running with the one bag over one shoulder and his men's warehouse uh, suit over the other, covered in plastic, open at the bottom. And as he ran, apparently it jostled the pants and they slithered off the hanger and ended somewhere in the gutter or on the sidewalk. And some homeless man is liking the way he looks, I guarantee it. <laughs> And so he starts yelling in my brother's house, I don't got no pants. And so uh, my sister-in-law had to jerry-rig a pair of my brother's pants. Um, anyway, he looked fine. So we walk after the conference into the White House, three homies, tattoos and suits. And there are butlers walking down the halls with trays of long stem glasses of white wine. And the homies are snatching those puppies as quickly as they can. <laughs> And so we go into the blue room and the green room and all these different colored rooms and st string quartets and little brass combos, very elegant. And then the gold room has the food and it's a comilonga. There's just so much food and gourmet, best food I've ever had in my life. I went back like nine times, you know. And, <laughs> and it had, uh, you know, rack of lamb perfection and a huge salmon the size of Wisconsin. And, <laughs> and, and so I'm standing there at one point and um, Gabriel's next to me and he eyeballs these potatoes kind of cut lengthwise with a hole carefully bore out in the middle stuffed with caviar and a sprig of chive. And he pops that sucker in his mouth, you know. <laughs> Spits the mess out into a napkin. This shit tastes nasty, he says. <laughs> now, let me just say that he was not using his inside voice at the time. <laughs> and, and was it me or did the Secret Service lunge ever so slightly? <laughs> Anyway, I told you all that to tell you this. We're on a plane the next day flying home and we're in mid-country and Gabriel says, I need to use the baño. And I said, well, it's in the back of the plane. Well, 45 minutes later, he comes back and I said, oye, cabrón, ¿qué pasó? I, I thought you fell in, okay. <laughs> oh, I was just talking to that lady back there. And I turn around and I see the flight attendant standing by herself at the back of the plane. I made her cry, I hope that's okay. And I said, Gabriel, it might depend on what you actually said to her. <laughs> well, she saw my tattoos and she saw my homeboy industry shirt. I don't know, she asked me a gang of questions. And well, I gave her a tour of the office. At 30,000 feet, Gabriel walks this woman through the office, he introduces her to job developers and hands her goggles so she can watch tattoos being removed, gives her a hairnet so she can watch enemies bake bread together. And afterwards, I told her that last night we made history. For the first time in the history of this country, three gang members walked into the White House. We had dinner there. 
I told her the food tasted nasty. <laughs> and she cried. I said, well, Gabriel, what you expect? She just caught a glimpse of you. She saw that you are somebody. She recognized you as the shape of God's heart. People cry sometimes when they see that. And suddenly kinship so quickly, two souls feeling their worth return to themselves, flight attendant, gang member, exactly what God had in mind. Only connect. And maybe there are some things you can't reach, but you can reach out to them and all day long. Thank you very much. You know, last night um, I heard Greg <coughs> and my mother and my youngest sister came <coughs> and we were going up to get our books signed and my mother kind of slinked over and she said, Father, I think you're holy. And I thought, you know, what is, you laugh, somebody helps you laugh, somebody helps you cry because you touch the heart of life and the heart of God. I think you are holy. That's holiness. Thank you so much for that, and um, more to come. Father Greg will um, just really receive your comments and questions and um, try to facilitate a, a conversation based on this morning or whatever else comes up. So please, um, you'll just recognize Good. whoever. Yeah. Okay. So go like this, I'll go like that. <laughs> Complicated and different, or not. Yes, ma'am. Um, one question I have is stand up as I listen to you talk. Yeah. Would you stand up? Uh, oops. Whoa. Hello. Hello, everyone. Yes. Um, I've been, I'm curious about the machismo amongst the males, and um, you have a very gentle way about you, and I'm wondering if you mirror. Uh, a type of male presence that, that <laughs> yeah, you mirror that machismo, but, um, so I've been... <laughs> we'll try to butch it up a little bit I, here. I just wonder if you become a model of a different way to be as a, as a male, or, um, cause I, it kind of dovetails with how you, how you work to get, that these guys could work together and let go of the stuff that was holding them back as enemies. Yeah. and now be these males that can cry and feel yeah. and love? Yeah, I, I don't think it's, it's way beyond machismo. So, you know, I, I was me meeting with the USAID people who wanted to uh, go down and to Central America and kind of solve their gang problem or something. And, and so they said, look, we're not interested in changing. We just want to change behavior, not identity. And I go, well, you know, at Homeboy Industries, we want to change identity. Because part of what's really important, the task, I think, among this population is, you know, they, they come to Homeboy Industries with what psychologists would call a disorganized attachment. You know, mom was frightening or frightened, and you can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. So the task is to really engage in attachment repair and, and real life healing. And if, if you're involved at all in, uh, you know, the uh, victim offender kind of restorative justice stuff, it's about coming to terms. It's about, you know, um, you know, kind of really taking a hard look at what's happened to you and what you've been engaged in. And so uh, then you gain a certain amount of resilience and then you have to engage in this task of absolutely redefining who you are in the world. 
and, and you really come up with kind of a new identity that says, I used to think courage meant having a gun. And now I can see that it has nothing to do with courage. So that when somebody uh, leaves Homeboy after an 18 month training period, you know, what we hope they have is that they'll, they know who they are now and, and that the world will throw at them what it will, but they won't be toppled by it this time. So it's way beyond uh, kind of the machismo thing. And I remember Homie said to me recently, you know, he was kind of pointing at his gang persona, which would include what you were talking about right now. And he said, yeah, I was disguised as that guy. And I thought, boy, that's really brilliant, you know. Uh, so, so the idea is, uh, you know, I'm in a Target and I see this guy, Joey, who worked for me for two years and then we moved him on to another job. And, uh, and he was, you know, in aisle five and with his two sons hanging on the shopping cart and we gave each other a big abrazo. And I always ask homies when I bump into them, you know, I kind of, it's kind of check and see, are they out there still, you know? How involved are they or whatever? Hey, do you ever hear from the homies, you know? No, I don't ever hear from them, gosh. Well, I, it's funny that you would say this. I got a phone call the other day from this youngster, which is sort of a generic term for a kid who's a sort of a new booty. And uh, I said, really, what, what did, why did he call you? I don't know how I got my number. He invited me to, told me I had to go to a meeting. And so gangs in LA anyway occasionally have meetings in parks or large areas that can accommodate hundreds of gang members and they meet, you know, and you gotta go. And I said, really, he invited you to a meeting? Well, what'd you say to him? He said, I'm not gonna go to your meeting. I'm a man, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I work. I'm not going to your meeting. I said, wow, what did he say to you? He called me a punk, <laughs> which is, you know, first of all, it's huge, strong, fighting words uh, that a little guy like this would call this guy a punk. I said, wow, what did you say to him? He said. If I was a punk, I'd be going to your meeting. <laughs> well, that's the sound of somebody who has really identified who he is now. Father, husband, working person, you know, and, and that's really transformation complete. Yes, holler it out and I'll, uh, because are by the time you... Are you guys just with you for 18 months? Yeah, the question are most with us for 18 months, you know, um, it's an 18 month training program. Sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll turn to each other on my council, which is made up of homies and people who run the place. I'll go, hey, I think he's a keeper. And, and that's somebody who we, we end up kind of uh, nurturing along who will become senior staff and assume a position of case manager or navigator or something in the organization. Somebody who kind of gets it and knows how to communicate it and knows how to carry himself or herself. So what's the success rate in 18 months? 100% uh, successful in 18 months. Uh, not that I measure or care, but because uh, uh, I, I dedicated a whole chapter in my book on success where I really believe with Mother Teresa who says we're not called to be successful, we're called to be faithful. So the idea I always tell my staff, just uh, fixate on the approach that you know is good, true, right, and just, and have no regard whatsoever for results, outcomes, or measuring success, which flies in the face of every funder on the planet, you know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know but in the federal government uh, system, uh, if you work with this population and you have a 30% retention rate, which means 30% don't return to prison, you are deemed an effective and successful program by the federal government. So we're at 75%, uh, and that's uh, been determined by a UCLA study that's finished a three-year research of a five-year research project. So, Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's funny. The question is about you know people say that uh, I was that it's they're looking for a family or whatever it is. And and today I you know on email at you know 4:30 this morning I was trying to address emails and I thought yikes here we go again. And, and I was getting a conversation with this person that I'm on a task force with. Well, everybody knows he says that kids join gangs and, and then he lists the usual list of what I call rational positives: belonging 
family, uh, protection. Uh, there was a fourth one. I uh, can't remember what it is. But that's because the outsider view insists that it has to be rational and positive. No one will join a gang knowing that this will end in death or prison, likely, unless we had a list of rational positives. And, and he was coming back at me, we, and he's from the federal government, from the Department of Justice, we ask gang members, you know, again, we ask them why. Well, of course they're gonna say family belonging, uh, they have my back, uh, protection. They have to say that. So here we're stuck. We keep perpetuating what I think is false, which are the positive, rational positives. And we keep saying, well, gang members tell us this. Well, of course, because they're not going to tell you uh, the truth, because the truth is painful unless you've really processed this. So, you know, I'm in a car with uh, two homies and we're driving to, uh, again, to um, Xavier uh, High School in uh, wherever it is, Palm Desert, and uh, I mentioned part of that last night. And so there are two homies, Manuel and Poncho, older guys. I go, look, I always say this. Please don't glorify, romanticize this thing, you know, because um, everybody knows, I say this, hoping that they'll take it in. Everybody knows that no kid is seeking anything when he joins a gang. He's always fleeing something. Always, no exceptions. Have I ever met an exception? Never, never. So I always say it's, you know, either the kid is despondent and overly so, or traumatized and overly so, or mentally ill. The only exception to the first two is if you're mentally ill enough, you know, but somebody's always fleeing something. They're never seeking anything. So don't romanticize this. So a kid, Poncho got a big, huge guy tattooed, and, and he's in front of the whole school, and I'm hearing his story, and I know his story, and so I'm listening to some of his uh, kind of boilerplate presentation, and then all of a sudden he stops. And again, it's, it's that moment when the kid is staring at a piece of his story that only he can see. And he says, I think I was six. Yeah, I was six. I was playing with matches. And it pissed my mom off, and she grabbed my hand, and she dragged me into the kitchen. And she turned on the, that electrical coil, you know, and it got red hot, but she waited till it was red hot. And then she, she just held my hand down on that for a long ass time, he said. Well, the whole crowd of the high school students, they gasped. And then he said, all I remember is I woke up that night in the bathroom and I was asleep on the floor, but my hand was in the toilet water just trying to get some relief because my hand was so pussy and burned. And then it was silence again and he looked out at them and he said, that's why I joined a gang. Mm. He, he hadn't retrieved that story until that moment and he didn't know that to be true until that moment. But if you had asked him 15 minutes before that talk, why did you join a gang? Belonging, family, they had my back, uh, protection, Wine, women, and song, join a gang and see the world. That's what he would have told you. He wouldn't have told you about that story. Okay, he had to be sort of led to that place. And that's part of what happens at Homeboy is you come to terms. But we've perpetuated this idea because it has to be positive and has to be rational, and it's none of the above. So I don't even know what to say to this guy that I was emailing this morning. I was going, of course gang members are going to tell you this. And they're going to tell you this for the last you know, three decades. And none of it's true. Yes, ma'am. You're returning to yourself. Somebody was asking me that as I was signing books. Um, you know, it's the truth of who you are, that you're exactly what God had in mind when God made you. So that's the essential truth. It's not about we're waiting for you to become a good person. No. God is waiting for you to discover what God has known all along. But you haven't known it because people are traumatized and damaged and mothers are dragging them into the kitchen and searing their hands. So it's kind of hard for them to see the truth. But isn't this the truth of everybody in this room that somehow uh, we get bogged down with some crazy notion of who we are and that what you hope 
to marry is the truth of who you are with seeing yourself as God does. And everybody knows in the deepest part of you that it's, as the homies say, all good. It's all good. It's not about measuring up. It's not about performance. It's not about one day you will arrive. You are the light of the world. You will not find anywhere in the gospel where Jesus says one day you'll be light. If you try harder, you'll be light. If you do the harder thing, you'll be light. If you sacrifice more, you'll be light. If you go to mass more often, you'll be light. No, you are the light of the world, period, the end. Now, whether you know that or not is sort of the question. You don't have to measure up. You just have to show up to that truth. Well, that's what you're, that's what you're engaged in. And in the process, you discover, wow, that's who I am, too. I didn't think that either. And here I'm the healer, and I'm the minister, and I'm the one who visits you in prison. No. Uh, you're, you're all working out your salvation, and your salvation is knowing uh, the truth. Yes, sir. Well, yeah, I mean, you do what you can do, and you put one foot in front of the next, and, and you make progress in the good, and, and it's incremental, and you have to be patient uh, with the slow work of God. And so it doesn't have to be big, flashy. You just have to kind of live as though the truth were true and put first things recognizably first. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're th tasks. Uh, I'm writing a second book, and I'm, I'm doing it exactly as you shouldn't write a book, which is to say I began with a title, you know? <laughs> uh, and I'm working backwards, you know? Um, so the title comes, as everything does in my life, from a story with a homie where he's sitting there, and I'm kind of running it down to him, giving him glecha, as we say in Spanish, you know, trying to school him on some things. And, and he goes, look, gee, please, you're barking to the choir. <laughs> And so it's a combo burger of barking up the wrong tree and preaching to the choir. And of course, excuse me one second, I'll write that down, that this will be the title of my next book. And I'm working from that. But the idea is to kind of say, you know, there's a countervailing message. You know, you, you really do have to bark up the wrong tree. You have to kind of say, you know, the world is all about um, polarizing and division and separation. And we say, no, that's an illusion. Separation is an illusion. There is no them. There's never been a them. It's just us. So you bark up the wrong tree, you know, when the tree that everybody's sort of claiming is, is that place of great division. And you preach to the choir. You try to get folks like yourselves galvanized to, to you know, make progress <coughs> uh, with that message. And, and you know, you, you try to... Uh, uh, present a larger love as best as you can, and and you try and it's and I'll be honest with you, you know, because that's hard to do in the church right now, you know, it's just really increasingly hard, and 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 this may seem like a parenthesis, but it's it's a thing that you know we want to be motivated by love, you know, and yet there's so much fear-based stuff that happens in the church, and it's it's shameful. You know, I was somewhere, because I go all over the place, you know, and speaking in the swing states, and, and you know, a priest came up to me, he goes, you're not going to believe, and I didn't even know him, you know, he just, I met him, and he said the bishop just came down with a, a directive and said, uh, kind of a now hear this, you know, uh, at funeral masses in Catholic churches, y you are not permitted to have eulogies. I go, what? I mean, none. It's not like have it at the end or have it somewhere. You cannot have them. And the priest preaching cannot mention the deceased in the homily. No, again, cuckoo bird. I mean, I don't know how you could defend it. But, but I, I, I look at it and I go, well, what, where is that coming from? Is it coming from our motivation is how do we make funeral masses, you know, a more powerful experience for people? Of course, there's nobody on the planet who thinks that's the motivation. It's fear. What if... Uh, I don't know, the resurrection gets short shrift. I mean, are you serious? <laughs> you know, eulogies will kind of get people, uh, again, fear is, is, uh, is the opposite of who Jesus is. And, and we got to always remind people. 
and 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 uh, frankly, you know, if if you go back to the original Latin and you translate it into an English that no one speaks in the English-speaking world for our liturgy. <laughs> I can't speak it as an English major. I go, I can't say that sentence. We pray, beseech the, I don't know what. I can't do it. Because I know where it's come from. It never once came from, from a motive that said, how can we make this a good experience for people? It was fear. What if people forgot that the Eucharist was sacred? And so you translate from the original language into an English that nobody speaks in the English-speaking world. And that's disheartening. And it's because we're afraid of the incarnation. We're afraid of rolling up our sleeves. We're afraid that here is where we're supposed to experience Jesus alive and present in people, in their experience. And I'm a Catholic till the day I die, but, you know, it's my church as much as it's anybody else's. And, and you have to kind of say, shame on us. We can't be motivated by fear. And you couldn't make a case that that move to change the language in the liturgy wasn't, of course, motivated by fear. What are we afraid of? And, and so bark up the wrong tree, I think. You know, Go ahead and say it. And, and, and the hierarchy will follow us, probably. <laughs> in your dreams, but <laughs> it doesn't mean you stop, you know. And, and I, I always, you know, a story I wrote about was, uh, you know, a kid who has just been texting me, is in rehab now, and, and uh, he was a kid named Robert who was a, a, abandoned and by his family, and just the nicest kid. And he worked for me on, on, our, on our graffiti removal crew when we had it, and and it, I remember it was New Year's Day, and he calls me. As thoughtful as this was, as a Happy New Year's. And I said, thank you, Michael. I, thank you for calling me. Well, it was a kid. I, I, I thought, you know, we just had a long Christmas break. And I said, hey, what you do for Christmas? Uh, and uh, he said, oh, I was just right here at his apartment, crummy little apartment. I said, really, by yourself? Because I knew he had no family. Oh, no, no, I invited some of my coworkers, some of, some of the homies from the graffiti crew, I, other guys who didn't had no place to go. Mm. And he listed the names, and half of them were enemies from rival gangs. He had seven over to his apartment. I said, what'd you do? I said, you're not going to believe it, I cooked a turkey. <laughs> I said, wow, seriously. Um, and, well, how did you prepare it? He goes, you know, ghetto style. I said, well, I'm not sure I know that. I'm uh, uh, not familiar with that recipe. And he said, well, you rub it with a gang of butter, and you put a gang of uh, salt and pepper, and you put it in the oven. It tasted proper. And I said, really? Wow, I'm impressed. Well, what else did you have besides turkey? Just that, just turkey. <laughs> yeah, the seven of us, we sat in the kitchen staring at the oven, waiting for the turkey to be done. <laughs> now I ask you, Try to imagine anything more sacred than seven enemies sitting in a kitchen, staring at an oven, waiting for the turkey to be born. And that's what the incarnation is. And that's what the Eucharist is. And why in the world would we ever want to separate the sacredness of that turkey dinner from the sanctity of the Eucharist. No, we don't. We want to. We want to go like this with it. Yes, there it is. That's the Eucharist. Social justice and getting parishes to move, uh, and all we do is uh, soup kitchens. Um, you know, one of the things that at, at Dolores Mission, you know, when we declared ourselves a sanctuary for undocumented men and women, uh, you know, part of the thing was we because there were um, people were being deported and especially in those days that was the Immigration Reform and Control Act and families were being separated. So we, we opened our church and so for 23 years a homeless undocumented men have slept in the church. We used to have women and children up in uh, what was the convent part of where that school was I was talking about. So, um, so it wasn't about 
our parishioners, who were the poorest in the city, going to Skid Row and serving a meal, they go, our church is empty. We have arms. We can gather, you know, beans and rice. So uh, we're always going outside when, rather than opening up our facilities, you know. So it's always the model is immersion. We're going to go outside, which is good. It's not to say don't do that. But, it, but part of the invitation is to imagine reverse immersion. People coming to us, coming to our universities. Uh, the doors are open. Yeah, you can use this room. Yeah, you can sleep on that floor with the mat or something. Or whatever it is, you know. And that's, that's really about kinship, you know. The poorest parish in the city are feeding people who are poorer than they are, you know. And we've been doing it for a quarter of a century. So... Um, I think that's important, you know. I don't know. You know, part of the thing, the invitation has to, you, you, the appeal is not to the, I always think this when, you, when I speak to people, and I tell myself this, don't speak to their conscience. Speak to their goodness, which is, it, it, I think that's important. I know that that works. If suddenly your audience knows that they're good, then there's no stopping them. But if it's all about a guilt trip or conscience or by God, you're not doing enough on this issue. And, and again, Jesus didn't take the right stand on issues. He stood in the right place. So the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers and the single hearted and the folks who work for justice, that the language isn't about blessed or happy. The original language is you're in the right place if you're a peacemaker or single hearted or struggle and suffer for justice sake. It's not, after all, it's not a spirituality. It's a geography. It's telling us where to stand. Mm -hmm. So parishes uh, have to feel that invitation that, that's, that's extended to their goodness. It's not supposed to mess with their conscience. But we always do that. That's how we do this. You know, we're not enough, and we're not doing enough, and, you know. Got time for a couple others. Yes, sir. You know, if you've ever read Richard Rohr, his book, The Naked Now, you know, there, there's this whole thing. The subtitle of my new book that I haven't written is um, Barking to the Choir, Now Entering the Kinship of God. So that, uh, that it's about now. You know, uh, you know, it's like that announcement, uh, now hear this on the microphone, and you stop and you pay attention. It's about now. It's about here. It's about this moment. And the more you, that's my mantra. I always have trade-off mantras. This one has been with me for a little while. Now hear this. You know, I brace myself as a homie's about to walk into my office, and I go, this guy's belligerent and a knucklehead. Here we go. <sighs> now hear this, which means stay here, be here, don't be anywhere else, be with this guy, be in this moment, this day, with me, paradise, as Jesus says to the Ladron hanging next to him. This day, with me, paradise. It's about here, it's about now, it's about the present moment. There is, that's all we have. All we have is today. So for me, that's sustaining, you know. And, uh, you know, and part of the thing, you know, people talk about holiness, you know. And, uh, and God, you know, it's easy to refute that, you know, to any accusations that I'm holy. I don't feel that, you know. Um, but I recognize, you know, I just want to bask in, in people's holiness, you know. So I remember once walking in the projects late at night, and uh, I saw a homie named Carlos, and 16 years old gang member. He's just sitting by himself on the front porch of his uh, apartment in the projects in a very dangerous area. And uh, I see him there, hey, Carlos, Kiole, how you doing? And I sit down, now I'm oh, gee, isn't that funny that you would show up right now? I said, why? He goes, well, I was just sitting here and I'm praying. And I say to God, God, give me a sign that you are as great as I think you are. <laughs> And, and you showed up, and I, I and I, I, I was, I thought the day won't ever come when I'm as holy as this kid.
gang member, 16-year-old, sitting on the stoop, praying for God's sakes. You know, Halloween's coming up, and I remember I was, I was standing with um, a homegirl who came in, and Lisa, and, and I knew her from back in her gang-banging, crazy, knucklehead days and from the projects, so I've known her a long time. She's standing there with her little son, who I think was a first grader at Dolores Mission Catholic Parochial School. Uh, not a sixth grader, a first grader, a little six-year-old, or whatever, however old. He was in the first grade. And he's just staring at me as Lisa's talking. And finally, at one point, he tugs on uh, Lisa and says, Mom? And she goes, yes. For Halloween, I'm going to dress like Father Greg. <laughs> and, and we laugh, you know. And she goes, why? Well, because at school they said, you have to come to school on Halloween dressed like a saint. And then we laugh again, and Lisa goes, Honey, Father Greg's no saint. <laughs> and I go, Thank you, thank you very much. You know, so. <laughs> and it just, uh, you know, the holiness is there, and that's what the incarnation's about. It's just that it's, uh, you want to be there when it happens. Uh, Woody Allen says about death, I, I'm not afraid of death, I just. Don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> but everything else short of death, you know, like uh, life and goodness and holiness, you want, to, you want to be there, you know. You don't want to miss it. That's what sustains me. One last question. Yes, and you actually have a microphone. Uh, yeah, she saw me and <laughs> helped. Um, you mentioned why join a gang, and that made me think of two things. The example you gave was the six-year-old's hand being seared by the mother. And that's his realization. That's why he joined a gang. That was his answer. So I'm thinking about two things. One thing I'm thinking about is parents and how they handle maybe guilt or if they are really guilty. And the second thing is, well, if we know why they joined a gang, how can we prevent them? Yeah, so I think, you know, you infuse hope to kids for whom hope is foreign. You heal the traumatized so that they um, transform their pain and no longer transmit it. And you deliver mental health services in a, in a timely fashion. I, I just got a text right now, again, from a homie named Frankie, all covered in tattoos and from a gang called 38th Street. And uh, he just had a, his lady just had a baby, so he just sent me a picture of the baby, and it's very sweet. But I, I brought him with me uh, to give a talk to a bunch of social workers. And, uh, and he had never given a talk before. And in and, and the workshop, of, it was a thing, who are your mentors? And so he said, uh, uh, I said, I, you know, I just gave him a little, so try to find a mentor in your life and, and talk about it. So he got up there and he started to tell this story about uh, this kid, Carlos. And, but he prefaced it by talking about the family in which he was raised, you know, and heroin addicts and gang member parents. And, and again, you're not supposed to rush to judgment on who these people are. That where they're coming from is a great place of awe. You have to stand in awe at what they've had to carry. And uh, at one point, he was nine years old and he ran away from home. And uh, he said, it took 30 days for his mom to turn to his siblings and say, Hey, has anybody seen Frankie? 30 days. He was nine. But anyway, he got around to talking to about his uh, mentor. And uh, he was just a, a little kid, you know, 10 years old or something. And, and his mentor was a guy named Carlos, who was uh, a senior in high school. And he used to come by and, and rescue this little, t this little kid, Frankie. And he'd pick him up and walk him to school. And he, he, and he said, and Carlos gave me good advices, he said. And he's telling this whole room. And he, he said, he'd walk me to school every day because he knew what I was living in. And he'd rescue me every day. And he'd point out stuff. He'd say, see that alley there? Don't go ever go to that alley. And stay in school. And see those guys over there? Don't ever talk to those guys pointing at some gang members. And one day, Carlos had come to rescue him. And he was walking him to school, and he says, uh, I'm going to graduate from high school, and then I'm going to graduate from college, and I want you to do the same. 
then I'm going to go to med school, and I'm going to become a doctor. Then I'm going to come back and get you to rescue you from the place where you're living. You'll be my son, he said. And so one day when he was walking him to school, the guys that he had pointed at and said, stay away from those guys, came over and hit Carlos up, said, where are you from? What gang are you from? And uh, Carlos says to Frankie, ignore them, ignore them, keep walking. We asked you a question, where are you from? And he said, I'm not from anywhere. Keep walking, Frankie, keep walking. And then Frankie, in front of this whole room of social workers, he said, in an instant, my face was splattered with blood and pieces of Carlos's brain. And I turned, and he was on the ground. And he was dead. He had never told that story to a human being before until that exact moment. Somehow he retrieved it, and it appeared to him. And he's sobbing, sobbing, telling this story. Of course, that's why this kid joined a gang. Of course, of course, of course. Any other reason? No. No other reason. And so it galvanizes us to, to, to know that the measure of health of any community is our, resides in our ability to stand in awe at what some people have to carry and to take giant steps away from judgment so that we can, in fact, be helpful. And, and that's what we're all called to do. Anyway, I've overstayed my welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> What can we say? And anyway, you are holy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Greg, for all you uh, said and all you do. That's the more important thing. So what a gift today.